In this video, we will create a domain checker that is powered by a CLI. So command line interface, we created a few in the simple automations section of this course. The web service we're going to use for this is called GoDaddy. And here we can, for example, search for my domain and then get an indication whether the domain is free or not. The most common and popular Python library for HTTP requests is called request itself. The good part about this external library is that it provides us with a lot of things like, in addition to that, the tool is very popular, so it has 42,000 stars and it's basically the go-to library for requests in Python. Since it's an external library, we need to go to our terminal and first install the library to make sure that we are able to use it inside of our scripts. After installing the library, let's switch over to VS Code and start implementing our argument parsing first. The capability we want to provide our users with is that they can pass a simple domain to our command line interface and then that domain gets used for the checkup. So let's create a simple positional argument of type string and give it a help text and then parse the arguments and check if our script is actually printing our given domain. Looks good. So now we are ready to go in and actually do some more implementation. The next step is to implement the request to GoDaddy API. And in order to do that, we want to simply check out the domain specification of GoDaddy itself. So let's switch over to the GoDaddy API. And as you can see here, I'm logged in with my John Doe account that I use for several implementations and tests. And then we want to head over to the documentation. And for GoDaddy, the documentation contains a lot of elements. We want to have the domains API here. Looking at this page, we can see that it has a Swagger API and this is really good because now we can actually try out all those features and just simply give it some, for example, my domain and then execute it and see what the response will look like, what the request will look like and so on. The response body will come in handy later when we do the parsing of our response. In addition to that, we can see the full qualified URI that is being used as the destination for a request. Even more important, they provide a curl request, so we can simply copy and paste that and use it as a starting point for our implementation inside of Python. What we want to do with the curl request now is create a URL and then also paste the headers to our request session. So let's paste the whole curl request here and then extract the URL to be able to add this as a variable here. Remove all the clutter from the end of our URL and then remove the HTTP headers to be separately. This OTE here stands for something that is interesting. So let's look that up inside of the documentation. And the OTE environment is basically a testing environment which we can use for the API requests or we can go to the production system afterwards. So it's basically a test instance of everything we want to do in order to not put traffic on the actual production system. Since we also want to start writing cleaner code here, let's create a method that is called getRequestURL that will return the request URL with the given domain. So in this case, as you can see, we only have to replace the domain timkosman.com with this given check domain, but this separate method will make our code more readable and even makes it much simpler to reuse this method in different places in our script. Let's invest a few seconds here to update the comments in our code, which is always important. Just remember that to always comment your code. It's really important for later maintenance and then paste our headers here in order to make sure that we set up a headers file, a headers dictionary that contains the required authorization and accept headers. Before we try to understand this authorization header a little bit more, let's go back to our documentation and go to the API keys in order to make sure that we actually have an API key set up. So let's create a new API key by clicking the button on the upper right corner and then define that we only need the OTE environment, give it a name and then simply save it and click next. This will create our key in secret and make sure to copy them now because they're gone once we close the window. As always, we want to create variables to store those information. So let's create one for API key and API secret, extract those information, and then we can click on the got it window and now see that the secret actually is gone. We now finally want to set up our request headers and they are based on the dash h elements we see below. So the first one will be our authorization header. And as we can see, the pattern of this 
header is SSO-key and then the combination of our API key and our API secret. So let's quickly set that up and then we can also add the accept header here. One thing to take into account is that there are several ways to authenticate yourself against an API. This one uses this SSO key, but there's also basic authentication, uh, OAuth authentication, bearer tokens and stuff like that. So it always depends on the platform itself. This accept header tells the server that the type of information we want to get from it should be in the format of JSON. Since we now have the headers and the domain set up, we can start implementing our requests. In order to do that, we again will define a method since we want to keep our code clean this time and make it reusable. So I'll add this check domain available method here. And since we want to pass in all the information from the code outside, we want to pass a parameter, an argument to this method as well, which will be the check domain. So the domain we pass to it as well. What we first want to do in this check domain availability method is printing that we're actually starting our check so to give the user some information, then get the request URL, which will be the call to our get request URL method, and then use the requests.get method that will take the URL and some more information like the headers or some authentication part. Of course, before we can use the method, we need to import the requests library into our scope, and then we're ready to pass the request URL to our get call, and in addition to that, add the request headers. Since headers are an optional argument, we need to add the headers attribute in order to assign the request headers to that specific attribute. In order to make sure that our request got through successfully, we now want to check what is called the status code of our request. Those request status codes are standardized, so if we go online and search for example for this 200 status code, we can see that there are a lot of other codes as well. The general categories we can see is 100 is for informational, 200 for success, 300 for redirection, 400 for client error, and 500 for server errors. The most common ones you probably know are 404 for not found or the 200 status code for success. In our case, we want to check for anything else than the 200 status code and then give our users some information that we could not get the availability of our domain. We will then tell him what the status code actually was and return so aboard our script here. Once we have checked for the status codes, let's check if the domain is available by actually calling our endpoint. However, before we implement that, let's go ahead and check if our script works until that point. So let's get the args.domain value that we pass as a domain CLI argument. And now we can already see that we get a 401 status code. So let's check back with the documentation what this status code means. And here we can see it's unauthorized. So something with our authorization is not working correctly. Our keys are still intact. We just created them. So let's go back to our script and actually check the authorization header. If we take a close look, we can see that there is a O missing here. So it was SS key, but it's actually SSO key. Doing the check again in our terminal, we can see that it's calling the API endpoint and we see checking now, which means that the status code actually is 200 in this case. Since we now know that we get an actual response from our call, we can now get the response object as JSON format, since we know that the format is JSON as we've seen before when calling our element. Checking back with the documentation, we can now see how handy it is to get a response example here. So we can just use that as an indication on which attribute provides us with which value. So let's add the final check in order to check whether the availability flag is set to true in order to make sure that we can inform our users that the, the domain is available for purchase. So let's add some basic logging here as always and then also cover the else case that when the domain is not available, we'll give it the current time stringified to be the format of year, month, date and then hour and minute and then give it the domain and tell them that it's not available for purchase. So going back to our terminal, let's check out if our script is working. And here we can see that the domain timcrossman.com is available for purchase because we're on this OTE system. If we change the domain to something more popular like google.com, we can see that we actually get an error that time is not defined. And this is because we use the time library in our else case, but we haven't imported it yet. So let's import the time library and re-execute our script here. And now we can see the actual output that the domain is not available and the current timestamp formatted as we wanted it.
This actually concludes our solo domain checker script. Since this project is separated into two parts, we now want to go in and actually replace this part when our domain is available and replace it with the Twilio API call in order to send us a WhatsApp message. However, before we do that, let's go over our script once again and see what we did. So the important part here is that we imported the request library and then work with the GoDaddy API and its credentials to set up a get request with the request API. We define some headers and in addition with the URL we get from our get request URL method, we did the actual call the get request to the API with our request library. We checked the request for its header and made sure that we got a successful response that we then parsed using the JSON method and finally outputted some information to our user in a stringified format for our timestamp. As quickly mentioned before, we will now go in and replace this highlighted section with the Twilio API and its message sending capability. So let's switch right over to the next video and continue working on this script.